To our fantastic protected zone audience. We had a few glitches in the line between Australia and Indonesia. Some sections of sound are not so great. We apologize, but please continue to listen to this excellent football podcast. Welcome to the Protected Zone, where we refine the fine art of AFL, explain all the strange things about the game, and offer our unique insights into the culture and politics of this great game, and of course, what happens on the ground. In the podcast this week, we review all the great games of Round 19. Is Dangerfield too dangerous? We discuss his crime and his punishment. Does the AFL take multicultural round seriously, or not? Video review, is it working properly? We also look at the history of the wooden spoon. We preview round 20, another great big round, and we offer our song for the week. We just don't know which way to go on this. You can subscribe to The Protected Zone on iTunes, listen to us on SoundCloud, YouTube, or go to the website, theprotectedzone.com. I'm Eddie J from Studio Sydney and in Studio West Sumatra. Hi, I'm Lin Tan and I'm in the city of Padan, West Sumatra. So Lin Tang, this round was so good that we are running out of superlatives to use. We've used up all the best words in the dictionary to describe season 2017. It's the season that keeps on giving and giving and then just when you think that there can't be any more, it gives some more and that's what round 19 was like. It was just the perfect round of AFL football. This weekend, you know, started on Friday night, a brilliant game and I thought, wow, couldn't be, be you know, all the games couldn't be any better than this. And then, you know, a draw and um, result of, uh, what, two, four six or 12 points you know separating two teams it's just um, you know my heart's uh, aching heart stopping so many times well mine is still pumping as well but the season is still highly in doubt in the sense that we don't really know who's going to be the premiership uh, winner or the favorite i thought that the adelaide were the premiership favorites but they played so poorly in that first half against collingwood and We're not even sure who will make up the finals yet or who will win the wooden spoon. But what can you tell me about that game between Adelaide and Collingwood? Well, you said Adelaide played poorly, but um, if you look at it the other way around, you know, Collingwood played brilliantly, carrying over uh, their last uh, term effort from the previous week when they, um, you know, caught up West Coast and snatched the victory. Yes, but how is it possible that a team can lose half of the game by 50 points, as in Adelaide, or conversely, a good team like Collingwood can win the first half of the game by 50 points, but then that can be totally swapped around in the second half. Collingwood um, it was brilliant in the first half. Um, they were leading by 50, and then uh, Adelaide stormed back the second half, what, kicking seven straight goals to Monk by three in the third, and then... You know, in the final quarter, the momentum kept swinging like a pendulum in the wild wind. Some experts are saying that this is the probably the best drawn game ever, and it's certainly one of the greatest comebacks ever to draw a game coming from 50 points down. So I, I tend to agree with them that it was possibly the best drawn game ever. Yeah, I mean, you know, both uh, supporters of both teams may, uh, you know, disagree. If you're a Collingwood supporter, uh, a bit heartbroken uh, because they were leading by so much. And if you're Adelaide supporters, yeah, their their lives are a bit saved and, um, you know, feeling more relieved. And what do you think we should do about those um, tied games? Well, I'm quite keen to keep a drawn game as a drawn game, but as as per usual, 
Some of the media experts and some of the former players have come out and argued that the game should keep rolling on. And one article that I read by Chris Judd, now don't get me wrong, he's a good former player, he won two Brownlow medals and he's got a premiership medallion, but he was suggesting a, a goal shootout in the case of a drawn game. How does it work? Well, you would have a certain amount of goal kicks for goal and you'd have one from 50 metres out straight ahead and then from the 45 degree angle and then from a 10 degree angle and it will keep going until somebody misses and I'm not I'm not very satisfied about this idea I I like the idea of uh, you know just uh, keep on playing until the um, you know next goal was scored or the next point was scored or whatever now I guess this issue is going to keep coming up whenever there is a drawn game but I was thinking about what the least worst option could be to resolve a draw and I thought that why not set up a mental test at the end of the game instead of a physical test because obviously they've exhausted all possibilities and I'm suggesting that what they could do is get the two captains, sit them on a small table in the middle of the ground on small chairs and have a fast game of chess. But I think this would be a bonus for the game itself, it would be a bonus for chess because the fast game of chess could be broadcast on the big screen at the stadium and it could be also broadcast at home to the viewers so it boosts the profile of of chess as well as giving a more satisfactory end to the game well my favorite game of the week was the port adelaide against st kilda game now this was a classic slimy ball game yeah, yeah, that was um, a low-scoring affair. Uh, you know, the, uh, the Saints should have won, could have won. And when I say should have, you know, two minutes to go and there are 10 points ahead and they lost from there. As you know, a game of AFL football is played over 120 minutes, not 119 or 118 or even 119 and a half minutes. you just got to keep going all the way until the end. And St Kilda seemed to forget that. And coughing up two goals in the final minutes, or the final one minute, that's not good enough. But at least we had the spectacle of the Port Adelaide supporters cheering their victory from the car park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they missed out the uh, you know that brilliant uh, combination, Paddy Ryder to Robbie Gray, who was running, and he kept them running towards a goal from the 55. Bang! The game over. Yes, well, it was like watching a Swiss clock in action. It was just so perfect, centimetre perfect, as, as we'd like to say, or as a famous commentator would say also. But for me, that was possibly up there as one of the games of the season. So well done, Port Adelaide and St Kilda. But St Kilda, you just have to remember that the game goes on for 120 minutes. And in some of the other matches, I noticed that North Melbourne stopped their run of honourable losses. They recorded a four-point victory in the howling wind against Melbourne. Yeah, that was a boil over, wasn't it? Um, uh, you know, everyone thought Melbourne should win, but uh, North Melbourne had something else in mind. Uh, fair enough, uh, they haven't lost to Melbourne for what, more than 10 years. Um, they have um, a 16-game winning stretch against Melbourne. Uh, since 2006? Yes, it is since 2006. Yes, and the ground, it was pl- the game was played in Hobart, and it was so windy. After the game, Brad Scott said, um, you know, the team knows um, how to play both ends, and they know the ground, and, uh, you know, and, uh, Brad Scott was rather uh, blasé about the, uh, you know, oh, yeah, we're we are going to win. Fair enough, they... Um, they beat um, Adelaide this year. Well, they really know how to work that ground, and I, I think they should possibly consider moving North Melbourne to North Hobart. Yeah, 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 that's a brilliant suggestion. You know, you, you have to go south to go north. Yes, and I think they should definitely consider that. So it was a very strategic game. North Melbourne were very well coached by Brad Scott. But I think the the game that had the best coaching by far was uh, the Sydney against Hawthorne game. Alistair Clarkson, the Hawthorne coach, he coached brilliantly against the Swans. Yes, uh, that was meant to be a Friday night sort of spectacle. And, uh, you know, um, you got the uh, best game. And uh, after, uh, you know, after, after watching that game, I thought, wow, that was the game of the round. And it was close to. Um, one of the players I was uh, very impressed was um, James Sicily uh, playing for Hawthorne. 
And the, uh, last week he was uh, seen as um, sort of agitating, you know, against the um, umpires and opposition players, but also with his own teammates. This week too, he had um, the moments of a sort of outburst, and which gave away free kick to Lance Franklin, and uh, he kicked only goal for the night from that uh, free kick. And uh, James Sisley had to be calmed down twice by Luke Hodge. But uh, in the last quarter, when the tension was high, he was so good. And taking all the intercept marks and, um, you know, just um, in the right place all the time. I was so impressed. And also um, impressing was the uh, Luke Hodge's role. He was just holding the um, rather makeshift defense, uh, Hawthorne fielded, you know, Jack Gunston, Caden Brand, Ryan Burton, all those, you know, um, not your uh, regular defenders, but uh, Hodge held it together, giving instructions everywhere and, um, you know, just yelling all the time, you know, um, he's, he's, he was so brilliant. And I thought Hawthorne should rethink his retirement. Well, they possibly should, but also his behaviour on the ground. That's what you'd expect from a general. Can you imagine Napoleon 200 years ago doing anything different to what Luke Hodge does? No, probably wouldn't. So he's got, he's got the nickname of the general for a good reason, and he showed it on Friday night. And as you mentioned, the... Hawthorne Sydney game was absolutely fantastic, but little did we know that that was not going to be the best game of the round. So, another fantastic round of football, and well done to the AFL. You're listening to the Protected Zone. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or listen to us on SoundCloud, YouTube, or go to our website, theprotectedzone.com. Up next, we look at danger, multiculturalism, video reviews, and the wooden spoon. Dangerfield, is he in the Dangerfield? Yeah, it has been much uh, discussed um, after the uh, game. Um, you know, his tackling was um, too crude uh, against the uh, Carlton's uh, ruckman, Matthew Cruiser. I uh, honestly thought penalty. I don't think it was a, such a crime. What did you think, Eddie? Well, I was more impressed with the debate that was raging in the media, and it ranged from Matthew Cruiser, the Carlton Ruckman that was the recipient of that tackle, that he should be suspended for being so weak. And it ranged all the other way to Patrick Dangerfield needing to be virtually executed for the bad tackle that, it, that almost killed the player. Now, there's nothing like a bit of hyperbole, but I think that was probably going a bit too far. I, my feeling is that if this tackle had been laid 20 years ago, Patrick Dangerfield would have received a free kick. 20 years later, in 2017, he gets suspended. So I'm not, I'm not so sure about this. Hmm, uh, that, that was what I felt, you know. Oh, I thought it was a legitimate, um, you know, tackle. And uh, initially I didn't see, oh, well, what's, what's the fuss? What's the fuss? And uh, just because, uh, yeah, it was, um, the yeah, debate was uh, even more... Um, you know, uh, multiple snowballed because uh, Dangerfield has been um, top, probably one of the top runners, top contenders for this year's um, uh, best and fairest, uh, the uh, Brownlow Medal. And um, it's not just best; you got to be fairest, and you can't be, uh, you can't win the medal if you're suspended. So. Um, yeah, that's sort of snowballed the, this argument. Um, people were saying that, uh, you know, should he sus- should he be suspended? No, 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 that would, um, you know, uh, deprive him of the chance to win the uh, medal two, uh, two years in a row kind of thing. Uh, it was a bit too much. And um, as I said, I didn't see very much in the uh, original tackle. And then the whole debate was just um, overblown. 
Yes, it was overblown. And I guess it's in the context of the AFL issuing that decree that the head is sacrosanct. And this is according to recent concussion research that's come out from the United States indicating that contact players in these contact sports receive too many knocks of the head, well, they suffer quite drastically in later life. So I guess that's the sort of thing that the AFL is thinking about. But still, I'm not so sure if it was the right decision. But maybe the Brownlow medal should be called the best and almost fairest instead of just the best and fairest. I do agree. And uh, just going back to the um, concussion thing, so does that affect the um, soccer players' um, heading balls? Yes, it would do. The research looked at all of the contact sports or as many contact sports as possible, so it's pretty much across the board. So whether that's soccer, Australian rules, rugby union, gridiron, rugby league, all of those contact sports that players are likely to butt their heads, uh, yes, it's become a bit of an issue. Well, thank God the, um, you know, the uh, uh, Langford playing for Hawthorne didn't go headbutting Sydney's McVie. He just gave a peck on the cheek. Yes, nothing a peck on the cheek. A tiny little kiss here and there, that's much better than doing the concussion process of headbutting someone. So there was a little bit of outrage about Will Langford giving Jared McVeigh a bit of a kiss on the cheek, but there's nothing wrong with that. I, better, I think it's better to kiss someone on the cheek than giving them a punch in the head. cultural round i was actually quite surprised about this because i started watching one of the games and they said this is the multicultural round but it, it was there was barely a whimper i hardly noticed it before some of the games there was a bit of ethnic dancing and food but multicultural round it should shouldn't just be about guzlami and sushi and baklava it, it seemed a little bit insulting to me i think it should be a lot more celebrated yeah i do agree and uh... I, I just couldn't understand the whole concept and uh, I didn't know the existence of multicultural round and until I saw one game on the ground, some, uh, you know, scripts were written uh, on the 50 meter arc and I thought, oh, they just um, wrote some um, thing on the ground and then I was told that it's a multicultural round. Oh, what do you mean, multicultural? Well, I think it was just paying a bit of lip service to the whole idea of multicultural Australia. But I think that in future years, there should it should be given far more prominence. But I think they should, the AFL should actually go a little bit further than just the multicultural round. They should introduce the subcultural round where they celebrate all the subversives, all the misfits, graffiti artists celebrate punk, skinheads, radicals, abstract and performance artists. Like They're the sort of things that the AFL should be encouraging as well. I do agree. And um, yeah, just going back to the multicultural thing, um, why don't they broadcast in different languages or, you know, something sort of a bit more, yeah, deeper than that. And uh, if you're going to a subcultural thing, yes, that would be fun. And uh, Toby Green uh, could spin a few discs. Oh, he certainly could. And I'd really love to see Toby Green play in a graffiti-type jumper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure there are so many, um, you know, judging from uh, all those players with tats on, I think they go out on Friday night and have a good time. And, uh, you know, and they should be encouraged, all those different subversiveness. Um, some players, uh, you know, a bit too contrived. Uh, it's sort of unreal. I looked manufactured. You know, in this round of a multi-subversive cultural round, you know, everyone can just come out and, yeah, just go wild. And I mentioned the idea of special graffiti jumpers because there was a little snippet on the AFL website a few months ago. The Collingwood Ruckman, Brody Grundy, he was actually doing some graffiti on the streets of Melbourne and it absolutely looked fantastic. This is the easy part. When I paint, I just want to put Brody Grundy on the wall. So I just want to express myself and whatever comes out. So I just roll with that. <laughs> that looking good, mate. People perceive me as a bit of a different cut. I get a bit defensive about it. It's like, whoa, man. I consider myself quite a sensitive person. 
you know, I just care about things that aren't just, you know, getting the kick on the MCG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those things should be encouraged. Uh, you know, the, the, we should see the other side of players, not just in the a little video snippets provided by the league, but actually on the ground. You know, Brody Grundy uh, can do a sort of um, the fence around MCG with his graffiti or something, you know, just that kind of thing should be uh, more real than uh, this token uh, lip service given by the um, league. Well, I fully agree with you. I think that we need to look at subcultural round in 2018. And if, if they're not prepared to go for subcultural round, call it graffiti round or something a bit more acceptable now i don't mean the tagging type of graffiti i'm not a big fan of that but the full-on graffiti with the full colors the murals and if they're not prepared to go for that maybe abstract expressionist jumpers so there's a whole range of things that they could look at for 2018 The video review, is it working or is it not working? Yes, it's hard to say, but um, in this uh, exciting round of uh, round 19, there are occasions where video review was cold and uh, still we see the uh, inconclusive pictures. Well, the rule is that if there's a contentious decision, always the umpire, the goal umpire makes a, makes a decision. They will usually say, I think it was a goal or I think it was touched, but I'd like to have that checked. So if their first call is a goal and the vision is inconclusive, well, it's the umpire's call. So that's what the rule is. But I'm not so sure if the correct decisions are being made. Not my feeling is that the AFL needs to upgrade their cameras. Some of the quality of the footage looks like a cheap webcam. The vision was so blurry and, um, you know, there are, what, how many, how many cameras are there? Four or something. And uh, they try to cover all angles, but... Uh, you know, at a crucial point, blurred or, you know, other players were in line and uh, can't see. So, you know, not just investing in camera uh, cameras, uh, that could, you know, uh, umpires or other players should tell them, hey, you're blurring the vision, get out, you know, that kind of thing, so that you can see clearly, view it. Well, I think it should go one of two ways, either... The AFL should fully invest in high definition cameras on the on the ground at the goalposts and have a full 360 degree angle, including from a t- above and below. They should either do that or just leave it entirely to the umpires, because after all, life is imperfect and sometimes the wrong decision is made. Yeah, I, I do. I do tend to agree with the um, you know just leave it to the um, umpires, humans. You know, it's going to be an, uh, always a grey area, errors, a margin of errors and um, doubts. So just forget about technology, you know, just uh, leave it to the humans as we always did. And, uh, you know, that's final. You know, umpires make a decision on the spot and that's final. Yes, and the umpire's decision should be final. Last week we talked about the wooden spoon and we talked about it at length and some people contacted us after the program and asked us what is this wooden spoon all about? What what does it mean? What does the award look like? Now, in the AFL there there isn't actually a wooden spoon award. It doesn't exist. But I started thinking about that and I thought, well, where did the wooden spoon come from? Do you know very much about the wooden spoon? No, I was born with silver spoon. I've never had a wooden spoon, so I really can't tell. Eddie, you tell me. Well, I did a little bit of research before the program, and I found out that the wooden spoon did actually exist. It started off at the University of Cambridge in the early 1800s, and it was it was awarded to the student that had the lowest exam mark but still managed to pass their degree. So it's a little bit of a booby prize, if you like, and 
then that was applied to football later on, different sports where the wooden spoon was like the the award that was given to the, the team that would come last. And at the University of Cambridge, it actually was a physical award where initially it was just a small brown coloured wooden spoon and then that ended up growing and eventually the last time that it was awarded physically was in 1875 and the wooden spoon at that time was five metres tall. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, it's a great idea to reintroduce uh, actually physical thing to give it to the um, team finishing at the bottom. You know, just uh, they need to be awarded. Yes, and it should be. It's a it's an award of irony, and I think AFL appreciates irony sometimes. And I also looked up the records, and St Kilda has got the most wooden spoons. It's got twenty seven, and that's twice as many as the next team, which is North Melbourne. That's really some achievement. Yeah, well, you know, they 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 only won one top award, so uh, they need to compensate it somehow. And uh, you know, twenty seven wooden spoons in their collections to go with one sole premiership cup. That's yeah, Saint Kilda. You're listening to the Protected Zone. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, listen to us on SoundCloud, YouTube, or go to our website, theprotectedzone.com. Up next, we preview a big, big round 20. Round 20, there's quite a few big games happening in round 20. What can we expect to see on Friday night? Now, another blockbuster. Uh, between Sydney Swans and uh, Geelong Cats. Uh, both teams are, you know, nearly top four, uh, what, second and sixth. So um, it's another classic eight-pointer. Yes, it is, and it's being played at Cardinia Park. Since Geelong renovated the Cardinia Park, which was six weeks ago, they haven't lost a game there. And the shape of the ground is very long and it usually favours Geelong. But Sydney did defeat them last year. Can we expect to see a repeat of that game or will Geelong carry themselves over the line yet again? Well, um, Geelong has a um, you know, very good record, as you said, in, uh, at home. Um, but this game without Dangerfield. Oh, that's right. Patrick Dangerfield is not playing. He's been suspended. So... Is Patrick Dangerfield the Daniel Wells of Geelong? Um, it's hard to say, but um, Dangerfield was in the hot form for for much of the uh, this season. I mean, he never had a bad game. That's why he was a contender for a Brownlow Medal. Um, would that affect the um, you know performance of um, the other half of um, uh, Dangerwood combination? You know, um, Joel Selwood. Um, he is often tagged out. Um, you know, opposition teams target him uh, to, um, you know, curb the um, sort of um, the midfield drive by the Cats. So it's interesting to see uh, Swans go tagging him and also interesting to see if Josh Kennedy uh, will play or not. He had a bit of um, hum, hummy, hummy problem. And also um, the other thing to watch is uh, Lance Franklin. He was um, rather quiet in the game against Hawthorne. He only kicked one uh, from the, um, that uh, James Sicily silly free kick. So uh, there are quite a few things to watch. Um, you know, we talked about the Sydney being a red-hot uh, form, but um, Hawthorne showed that, um, you know, Sydney is not um, invincible. Well, I'm thinking that Sydney will win this game because Patrick Dangerfield, I know that the game of AFL is played by 22 players on each team, not just one, but he's such a massive player for Geelong and I feel that if there's no danger field, there's no Geelong. So I'm tipping Sydney for this big game. Well, I'll still go with the Cats. Um, I think they've got they've still got the, what uh, seven or six lives left. So we'll see how that one goes. The big showdown. It's Port Adelaide against Adelaide. Some people have been saying that this is the biggest showdown ever, but will it be? My feeling is that Port Adelaide is still a flat track bully, and Adelaide just fell over the line against. 
Collingwood. Well, they didn't actually fall over the line. They just fell on, on the line against Collingwood in that draw. But this is a hard one to predict as well. Where are they playing? They're playing in Adelaide, strangely enough. So the winner will be a team from Adelaide. I believe that the, the, the winning team will be a team from Adelaide. Port Adelaide have got a much better overall record against Adelaide. They've, I th- believe that they've won twice as many games against Adelaide. Right, um, but this year um, Adelaide's sitting, um, you know, a few games clear on top of the ladder and the Port still sitting at fifth, even though they're, you know, uh, called uh, flat track bullies. Now, um, Port Adelaide have to show something this weekend to um, dispel that tag. And the way they played, they snatched the victory out of the um, the jaws of death last week. I think they might have a momentum, Um, you know, even though they played badly ordinary uh, footy uh, throughout the game against the Saints. But the way they came back, uh, that might be the turning point. Uh, I think, uh, if they're going into the uh, September, uh, deep into the September, I think that could be a turning point. So I'll go for Port. Well, I think it was a bit of a turning point for Port Adelaide. They should probably leave their supporters in the car park this time around just for good luck. Adelaide also had their momentum last week, coming from 50 points down to not go over the line but land on the line against Collingwood. It's a difficult one to predict, but my feeling is that Port Adelaide have got more to lose in this game, and they'll beat Port, they'll beat Adelaide not by much, but just by a little bit. The other big game of this weekend is Richmond against Hawthorne. That's a massive game at the MCG. Yeah, as we've been talking about, um, you know, Hawthorne's influence in the final what five six weeks, and they are they're proving we are right. Um, Hawthorne's, um, you know, has got its own sort of uh, interest. Um, themselves have still got chance to make it, but um, they certainly, um, you know, influence others too. Well, it's almost like Hawthorne. They realise that they're an excellent team, but they had an existential crisis at the beginning half of the season. And by the time they got out of their funk, they realised that they were actually top-line professional AFL footballers. They started playing like a very, very good team, but I think they've left their run a little bit late. Even if they win all of their final four games in the home and away season, they might not make the finals, but I agree with you. They will cause a lot of trouble for other teams. Yeah, and uh, on paper, it is um, a fourth playing against a 12th, but uh, it, I think it's going to be a lot closer than that. And I, I say uh, Hawthorne's... Uh, the form team at the moment, replacing Sydney as the um, you know form side. You know that keeps changing. You know Melbourne one day, Saints the other day, uh, Sydney had a momentum, and Hawthorne. You said um, you know may have left it too late, but I might suspect they may be peaking at the right time. So I'll go for Hawthorne. I'll go for Hawthorne as well. So we'll look at the quick tips for all the other games. There's one game being played in Canberra and there's Greater Western Sydney against Melbourne. After the match, they could go to Parliament Question Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are they playing? Marnica Oval. That uh, sort of weird-shaped ground, isn't it? It's an odd-shaped ground, but it is a it is an official AFL ground, so it's all been marked up correctly and that sort of thing. But like any other game or any other ground, it has goalposts at either end. So I don't think the size or the shape of the ground should make that much difference. But I do accept that in Canberra, it's a very cold time of the year. Ah, yeah, I keep forgetting that. Um, you, you guys are having winter, don't you? Yes. Ah, yeah. It's in the, you know, I'm living in the tropics and every day is the same. The sun comes up at 6.30, goes down at 6.30. Every day is hot, hot, hot. I miss colder seasons. Um, anyway, so Canberra is a perfect place to be in, um, you know, winter time. Um, yeah, so Greater Western Sydney, will they uh, like the uh, that sort of cold weather? Um, they, uh, you know, finally came out of um, the sort of um, the winning last week, but it wasn't convincing, was it? 
No, it was very unconvincing, in fact. The first half in the game between Greater Western Sydney and Fremantle was possibly the worst football that I'd seen in 25 years. Yeah, and uh, Melbourne had a bit of problem, you know, even though um, that, they were sort of blown away by the uh, Hobart wind. But um, they're losing against the um, wooden spoon contender in the way they did uh, was not very uh, convincing either. Well, I'm, I'm going to go for Greater Western Sydney in this game. Yeah, they've got a lot to approve, uh, but uh, Melbourne seems to be, um, you know, sort of um, playing. Yeah, well, uh, I'll go for Melbourne. Essendon against Carlton. Normally this would be a blockbuster, but not in this year. Essendon are contenders for the top eight. Carlton are contenders for the wooden spoon. Yeah, contenders versus contenders. And who will be winning? I think uh, Bombers in the better form. Um, their forwards functioning. Joel Danaher is in, um, in a good form. Um, Carl Hooker didn't do very well last week. But um, overall, I think Essendon has got more firepower than Carlton. I'm going to go for Essendon. Brisbane against Western Bulldogs. For me, that's a little bit of a yawn game. Yes, uh, Western Bulldogs um, played brilliantly against uh, Essendon. It was because Essendon allowed uh, that sort of game. It didn't tag um, JJ, and the JJ was brilliant. And um, uh, Essendon allowed uh, Western Bulldogs a sort of fast running game. And um, the game itself was great, um, you know, uh, fast moving. And as you said, you know, the ball, ball keep coming back this way, that way, moving around so quickly. And that's the style Western Bulldog wants to play. And uh, will Brisbane allow them to play that game, kind of game? Or will Brisbane have a you know, uh, um, ability to stop them. Well, Brisbane are a much better team when they play in Brisbane. I'm actually going for an upset in this game. I think that Brisbane might be able to do it against the Western Bulldogs. I think they will. Um, they, they don't want to get the wooden spoon this year. Speaking of wooden spoons, there's another wooden spoon contender in this game, North Melbourne against Collingwood. I'm not talking about Collingwood, I'm talking about North Melbourne. Yes, uh, Collingwood, uh, you know, they had a momentum and, uh, you know, they had the resolve to uh, sort of peg back. But uh, in the end, that wasn't good enough. And as, I, as, as we discussed, it's uh, Daniel Wells playing against his former side. Uh, former side um, played brilliantly, but uh, it was in Hobart, their uh, next hometown, home game. Um, and um, this time, it's going to be um, uh, under the roof, I think. Uh, so there won't be any wind. Well, if there's no wind, I have to choose Collingwood. There's no question about that. Because North Melbourne, they're an excellent team when there's swirly wind, as we saw in the game at North Hobart Oval. But if there's no win, they'll be lost. Collingwood for me. Yeah, I'll go for Collingwood too. Fremantle against the Gold Coast. This is being played at Subiaco Oval in Perth. And they've had a bit of an incentive over there to get the the crowd numbers up. They've been offering meat pies, half-priced meat pies. And in the Western Derby game, we decided that the meat pie was the player of the match. Will we see that happening again in the Fremantle Gold Coast match? Oh, they should, because uh, otherwise uh, there's nothing to offer. Um, uh, do you expect people to come and um, watch the uh, Fremantle versus uh, Gold Coast? Nothing is at stake. Um, you know, they're not contesting for the uh, wooden spoon or, you know, premiership. I think that both teams are preparing for 2018, but there's absolutely nothing on the on the table for this game. So... I'm going for the home ground advantage here. It's one of Fremantle's last games at Subiaco Oval. I'm going to go for Fremantle. And uh, it said uh, Gold Coast. The final match that we're looking at is St Kilda against West Coast. And it's being played in Melbourne, which is not good news for West Coast. Yeah, St Kilda losing, you know, in last one one minute. They had 10 points and one minute. They couldn't defend that. That's just atrocious. Well, it is atrocious, but will they take that bad form in that final minute of the game into this week's match against West Coast? As I mentioned, um, you know, Port Adelaide, that was a turning point for Port Adelaide, um, that 
last 10 seconds. And uh, in the reverse psychological way, that was a turning point for the Saints. They, it's a nightmare, nightmare moment, and they will have to live with that nightmare moment. And uh, that's going to affect, even though West Coast doesn't have a good record in Melbourne, but uh, they have a better uh, record at um, Docklands. So um, I'll go for West Coast. I think I'll go for West Coast as well. You've been listening to The Protected Zone, where we talk about the fine art of AFL, we explain all the strange things about the game and offer our unique insights into the culture and politics of this great game. Also, every week we choose a song that we feel best summarises the round that we've just had. And as far as I'm concerned, this round didn't resolve anything. The whole season is still unresolved and we don't know which way it's going to go. So what better way than to choose a song called Which Way To Go? It's by the Melbourne Indie Band, the Eddie Current Suppression Ring, and there's nothing more Melbourne than a Melbourne Indie Band. So we're going out with Which Way To Go by the Eddie Current Suppression Ring. See you next week. Bye-bye. See you later.